So just as an anatomy review, um, we have a coronal and sagittal view of the male lower urinary tract. And of course, as you know, the bladder sits on top of the prostate. The prostate is divided into um, three areas here where the uh, base of the prostate abuts the, the bladder base, the mid portion of the prostate, the apex of the prostate. Here is the internal um, urinary sphincter or bladder neck. Down here at the apex of the prostate, you have the, um, the uh, membranous urethra and where the urogenital diaphragm is. This is where the external sphincter is, which is the main continence mechanism. An important landmark here is the Vero Montanum, which is also called the ejaculatory duct. Um, you have the membranous, as I mentioned, the membranous urethra, the bulbar urethra, the pendulous or the penile urethra, the fossa navicularis, and then the external urethral meatus. So when you look at the picture on the right, which is the sagittal view, I think the important part here to note is the S, I'm sorry, the S shape of the male urethra. This is important because the degree of rise that the urethra takes through the prostate to meet the bladder neck can actually be obstructive in and of itself. Um, and an elevated bladder neck is a consideration in which treatment uh, procedures are, um, will work the best in that anatomy. So this picture just again shows a normal, normal side prostate on the left with a patent urethra. And on the right, you see as the prostate enlarges, it can constrict um, and physically obstruct the urethra and the bladder neck. Here we have some axial CT images. Uh, the, the scan on the left shows um, an average or normal sized prostate. Oops, sorry. which is considered to be approximately the size of a walnut. On the right, you see a severely large prostate. It's so large, in fact, it's extending into the lumen of the bladder. Here we have some endos endoscopic views of the prostate um, with the flexible cystoscope. So when you do flexible cystoscopy, you enter the bladder and you can actually flex the scope 180 degrees where you're looking back on yourself, and that's called retroflexion. This is a retroflexed view of the bladder neck. And on the left, you see a normal prostate where you really can't appreciate any of the prostate tissue from the bladder. On the right, you can see a severely enlarged uh, prostate. Not only is it large, but it's actually bulging out into the bladder lumen. This is what we call a, a ball valve configuration, and it can be particularly obstructive. It's important to know if you have this type of configuration, again, when you're considering your different treatment options, because some of the options do not treat this, which we call an intravesical median lobe. So benign prosthetic hyperplasia, not hypertrophy, which it's sometimes erroneously called, is a histologic diagnosis. So although we presumptively give the diagnosis on the basis of clinical symptoms or on the size of the prostate on digital rectal exam, it really is a diagnosis that's made under the microscope. It's caused by the prol proliferation of smooth, smooth muscle cells and epithelial cells in the prostatic transition zone. Now there are four zones of the prostate, the anterior zone, transitional zone, central zone, and peripheral zone. And you can see that the transitional the transitional zone where BPH occurs is in the proximal urethra near the bladder neck. So the exact etiology of BPH is, is unknown, and it is felt to be multifactorial, uh, although we do know that male andro androgenic steroids play at least a permissive role. It's also extremely common. 60% of men age 60 will have histological evidence of BPH and that rises to 80% at the age of 80. 90% of, of men between the ages of 45 and 80 have some type of lower urinary tract symptom. And by the eighth dec decade, 50% of men will have moderate to severe LUTs um, as measured by an AUA symptom score of greater than or equal to seven. So the onset of enlargement and the rate of growth is variable person to person. It's also important to note that not all men with prostatic hyperplasia will have prostatic enlargement, and not all men with enlargement will have obstruction. As a man ages, there is an increase in the prostate stroma, as well as an increase in the number of the alpha-1 receptors within the stroma. 
this is felt to be the most important factor in causing the symptoms associated with BPH. An enlarged prostate can cause obstruction in two different ways. One, with direct obstruction of tissue, and this is called static obstruction, as well as indirect obstruction from increased tone of the smooth muscle, and this is called dynamic obstruction. The symptoms of BPH are in two different categories, obstructive or voiding symptoms and irritative or storage symptoms. Obstructive symptoms include hesitancy, intermittency or a stop and start stream, a weak stream, the need to strain to void, or the sensation of incomplete bladder emptying. Irritative symptoms include daytime frequency, nighttime frequency or nocturia, and urgency. There are three categories of treatment, including behavioral modification, medical management, and surgical management. Within behavioral management, you have things like altering your fluid intake, having the patient perform time voiding, or limiting their bladder, irrit their bladder irritants. So first we're going to talk just a little bit about medical management of LUTs um, that are associated with BPH. There are three key receptors in the bladder. The M3 receptor modulates to trusor or bladder contraction. The beta-3 receptor modulates to trusor relaxation. And the alpha-1 receptor uh, modulates internal sphincter contraction, which is, sorry, I'm not good at using this. Am I going back or forward? Right here at the bladder neck. So the alpha-1 receptor is responsible for the dynamic obstruction of BPH and is the target of the first-line medications for BPH. So there are various categories of medical management, and these would include the alpha adrenergic antagonist, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, anticholinergics, beta adrenergic ag agonists, vasopressin analogs, PDE5 inhibitors, and phytotherapeutics. Today we're just going to talk about these top two because these are uh, the first line uh, therapy for BPH. So for the alpha adrenergic antagonists, they inhibit the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, which in turn re relaxes the smooth muscle of the bladder, neck, and prostate. This receptor has several subtypes, including alpha-1A, 1B, and 1D. The alpha-1A is the primary sub subtype in the prostate and it leads to the relaxation of the prostate, the bladder neck, seminal vesicles, and the vas deferens. It's also responsible for the side effect of retrograde ejaculation. The alpha-1B receptor is also located in the blood vessels and is responsible for the side effect of hypotension. And the alpha-1D is located within the bladder, the spinal cord, as well as the nasal passages and is responsible for the nasal congestion we see with this. So there are non-selective and selective alpha-1 blockers. The non-selective agents are terazosin, doxazosin, and alfazosin, And the selective alpha-1 blockers are, are tamsulosin and psilodosin. The more selective the alpha blocker is, the less non-neurologic side effects you'll have. So in terms of kind of the more common side effects of alpha blockers, um, dizziness, fatigue, nasal congestion, orthostatic orthostatic hypotension, syncope, retrograde ejaculation, and intraoperative floppy iris sy syndrome. So the floppy iris syndrome occurs in patients who are on or have previously been on uh, alpha blockers. This occurs because there are alpha-1A receptors in the iris. Um, in this syndrome, the pupil dilates, pure, uh, dilates poorly during cataract surgery. This shrinks the, the visual field for the surgeon so that he can not um, properly remove the, the cataracts, it increases the risk of complications. 